the marking of this particular moment that is the publication of After the Postcolonial Caribbean by Professor Brian Meeks. Uh, we have two panels today, as I'm sure you know, but for, if you did not happen to read your introduction or your materials, let me just uh, let you know the first will be Professor Bogues uh, will tell us some things about the press, publishing, whatever else he, he wants to bless us with today. And then the second panel will be uh, Professor Kamgisha and Professor Meeks in conversation. To introduce, uh, uh, well, first of all, let <laughs> me do the, the land acknowledgement. So Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island, on lands that are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. We acknowledge that beginning with colonization and continuing for centuries, the Narragansett Indian tribe have been dispossessed of most of their ancestral lands in Rhode Island by actions of individuals and institutions. We acknowledge our responsibility to understand and respond to these actions. The Narragansett Indian tribe, whose ancestors stewarded the, these lands with great care, continues as a sovereign nation today. We commit to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. To introduce Professor Bogues, Anthony Tony Bogues is a writer, scholar, and curator. He's the author and editor of 10 books in the fields of political thought, critical theory, Caribbean intellectual history, and Caribbean art. He's the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, Professor of Africana Studies, an affiliated professor in the Departments of History of Art and Architecture and Political Science at Brown University. He is also the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice here at Brown and the co-editor with Bador Alagra of the Pluto book series, Black Critique. Professor Bowles. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chair. Um, just uh, want to thank uh, all of you for being here and to uh, um, thank the Chair for that uh, kind introduction. I speak um, this afternoon uh, firstly on behalf of myself and Dr. Bedore Allegra, who's the Assistant Professor of Black Thought at the University of Texas, Austin, a former graduate of this department of Africana Studies and who's also currently the uh, research professor um, in Afri African American studies at uh, Princeton University for this year. Let me begin by talking about uh, the series Black Critique in which Professor Meeks's book is published and why such a series. Uh, sometime before COVID, um, myself and others were in discussions as that there were no there was no book series that uh, published uh, black radical thought. Um, there were books on black radical politics, black radical thought published by Duke or Verso and so on, but that there was no series that was devoted to thinking about the black radical tradition as well as uh, something that some of us call uh, black uh, critique. Secondly, we s scoured the, you know, as much as one can scour the um, Google to try and see whether or not there were books that were also publishing uh, black radical archival material. And we didn't find um, any at all. And so that, you know, you found individual books, presses, but you didn't find any series that mm -hmm. was devoted to publishing what some of us call Black Art Radical Archive. And so we then decided, um, myself first, that we needed to have such a series. And then in discussion with Professor Allegra, once she graduated and had a position at uh, UT Austin, um, she came on as a uh, co-editor. Part of what we are trying to do is to publish, yes, these books on black radical thought, but we're also, as I s trying to publish things on the black um, radical archive. Um, so at the moment, in 
in press is a, the proceedings of the that absolutely seminal conference of 1956 in Paris, um, where Amy Césaire, George Lamin, Franz Fanon, Leopold Senghor, um, you know, uh, Jean Pri um, Stephen Alexis, um, then chaired by um, uh, by Jean Priest Mars from from Haiti, the man who wrote in 1927, 28, so spoke Uncle. Uh, this really remarkable conference at the Sorbonne in Paris, one in where, as I said to people, where every black radical and his dog and cat um, were present. Um, unfortunately, there were no black women uh, there in, at, the act at the conference itself. And when you look at all the pictures, the actual translation, though, and interpretation, not translation, seemed to have been done by many black, um, by a group of black women. So we are about. So we are now in the middle of um, of putting that book together because in English it was published in Presidents Africans um, in Paris, uh, and uh, as part of what are the, some of the work that we do, um, we are also um, about to publish sometime by December the um, the speeches and writings of Fred Hampton. Um, and th we think that's, again, it's an archival project, but we think it's an extremely important um, arch archival project. And we're also about, um, we just signed off, and so we'll publish by the end of the year, uh, a book on the, on the Af African uh, liberation movements um, with participants who were involved in that movement. Um, and uh, with the exception, quite frankly, of Ethiopia, um, because of the way we have, we considered Ethiopia to be a special case, and that we will actually do a special book on on Ethiopia, um, given all that's all that's happening in Ethiopia today. So, if you look at one of the, if you if you look and see what we are trying to do, uh, you would see that the for us the quest, the black critique geographically is um, really about the black world, is about Africa. Is about um, Latin America. It, um, it's uh, we're, we're going to publish. For those of you who know anything about South Africa, um, in another two months we'll publish the selected writings of Neville Alexander um, from uh, from South Africa, um, and it's about the United States and uh, it's about the Caribbean, which is why when Brian's book came to us, um, immediately we thought um, this should be um, should be published in the series. So that gives you a sense of direction of what it is that we are trying to do. Um, we just rejected a uh, book of poetry. Um, we, they, we were not so sure. And, um, and we kind of hem and hawed about it and in the end decided that we weren't quite ready um, to go there. But we have actually accepted some biographies. Um, and my view is that we'll accept poetry in another, um, in another year or so, <laughs> when they, particularly um, if, uh, you know, uh, particularly when, when, when another set of pieces are given um, to us. We have published um, to date um, nine uh, volumes. Um, and I think over the, um, we had, we, we had a, a haters, as many of you would know, in, um, in during COVID, um, but uh, post COVID, as the publisher said, you guys seems to be on uh, steroid um, because we have just you know we we have we have uh, presented to the publisher a whole host of uh, a whole host of books, uh, and that to us is, is what is what I think is important. Um, and Professor Allegra and I have discussed this recently at an editorial meeting was the was that we we now find that um, a lot of younger scholars want to publish with us. Um, but we have taken the decision um, that it is, if it's their first book, they need to find not a radical publisher, um, because that was going to make their tenure process, if they want to be in the academy, that's going to make their tenure process a little difficult. Um, but there's one person who is insisting that he don't, doesn't really care. Um, uh, but people should know that this is, you know, that's something that they should be 
um, they sh they should be aware of. So how do we how do we see this series as, as this black black critique series? It is really the, the the political and philosophical grounds that we operate from is the following: one that the um, the since the neoliberal what Stuart Hall calls the neoliberal revolution which was consolidated in the 1980s uh, at a political institutional level with Thatcher, Cole, and Reagan, that the, there has been a, the left uh, or radical thought or critical thought, whatever you want to call it, has, um, has taken a back seat. And that what, what, what when the, in that pe in the period, that 40 odd years, 43 years since neoliberalism, quite frankly, um, that it was a period in which there was, that left ideas were defeated. That's how, you know, and in some uh, cases, it wasn't just ideas that were defeated. It's in some cases military, uh, political defeat was there because political defeat comes first before the, the defeat of ideas, <coughs> or rolling back ideas. But in some cases, it was also military defeat. Um, and so that in those, in, in, in that, mo in this period, in, wh in what some of us call the rhythm of revolt, um, you know, radical decolonization, et cetera, that the, what has happened is that the, the, has, we, uh, the conjuncture has been characterized by defeat. And, and a current conjunction as characterized by defeat mm -hmm. means that some of the ideas are, um, are, are, they have been rolled back, but also very importantly, the terms of the political debate has changed. And it is those terms of the political debate that we are preoccupied with. Uh, <clears throat> that we think that the, um, the ways in which, um, and I hear I always quote Mrs. Thatcher in, our birthday in the birthday party of Reagan when he was having our seismons, <coughs> where she said, don't worry, um, Ronnie, um, we have won the battle of ideas. Because of the battle of ideas, which is the, ter the terms of political debate and therefore the horizons in which one can think about politics and, and, and the different possibilities of change um, were, if you wish, um, narrow, become extremely narrow. Part of what <clears throat> I think that means is that there is, is that neoliberalism created within the political field a, um, a kind of uh, historical um, amnesia. And that, that in that historical amnesia, it wasn't just that ideas were defeated. It wasn't just that the political horizons were limited. Is that <clears throat> people thought that nothing happened before. Um, and, that, and if you didn't think anything happened before, you thought that everything that happened before it was ended up uselessly. And therefore, if it was useless and, def and so on, then it doesn't make any sense to think about anything else. Um, so this, this I this, this, mo no, this the notion that some of us have been working with a historical amnesia as part of the neoliberal revolution um, meant that the archives and the, and, the, and the ways in which black people um, historically have, not in a heroic narrative, but in a way black people have actually attempted to change their lives. Um, to you know, to do what um, what the African Americans call make a way out of no way. That those things I don't seem to be on the not just other not on the agenda, but it's just inconceivable. It make no sense to think to think about it. And part of that, I would argue, is the success of a certain of a creation of a certain kind of historical amnesia. So part of the political purpose of the series deliberately was to intervene in that historical amnesia. Um, to, to publish contemporary texts. So if you read Josh Meyer's book on, on black studies, which we just recently published, mm -hmm. Josh is at Howard University, is a contemporary text. Mm -hmm. But it is also to, if you read Professor Meeks's texts and, and if you read so, and on the text of Cedric Robinson, um, unpublished papers, uh, which, we, um, which we also published about a year ago, you will see that what we are doing is trying to intervene, is trying to bring to the fore a set of uh, archives and a set of writings and thought that has to do with black political and, and general left radical thinking that seems to be off to, to be off the off the table. 
So that therefore the series has to be considered as an, as an intervention. Um, uh, it is an, 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 an a direct political intervention into the, into, the, into the political field that now in which we all uh, inhabit. It is in that context that we accepted Brian Meeks's book as, as, one, as a book of intervention. Um, geographically, it's the Caribbean space. But some of the questions and some of the issues that Professor Meeks's um, book raises, I think, are important for those persons globally who are trying to think through this question of what next, how, what, what do we do, what, where do we go from here? Um, uh, are there any, as a friend of mine used to put it, uh, um, uh, are there any points of light um, that from the past that we might want to think about that might help us um, shape um, and think about, uh, think about the, the future? Professor Meek's book is the first Caribbean book, no, second Caribbean book. The first one was, um, was uh, the selected writings of Anne Dyer, um, the Guyanese, um, political, uh, Guyanese and Caribbean uh, political thinker, someone who I've written about as perhaps one of the finest political thinkers um, in the Caribbean um, in the late 20th century um, and, and early 20th, and that they, or the 21st, sorry, and so that uh, it's, it's, we, we have a Caribbean line, and there are other texts that are coming that I know that are coming from, from, the, uh, from the, you know, coming through that, through that particular line. <coughs> Professor Brian Meek's book is, uh, operates within this milieu, this conjuncture of the defeat. But he wants to rethink uh, possibility. He wants to think about something else within the Anglophone Caribbean. And therefore, if you, go to, if you look particularly at the last chapter, which is on about optimism, what you see is that Professor Meeks is uh, being somebody who grew up and participated in a specific moment in Caribbean history and political life, that he is trying to wrestle with the kind of general absence of a broad social movement or or an overt broad social movement in the actual in the in the Anglophone uh, Caribbean, and I say overt because we are accustomed as political analysts and so on to look for big signs, um, and but there may be other signs, particularly in the Caribbean, I would argue, at the level of culture and the level of discourse that are taking place that we are not yet able to read or we're not reading in a certain way um, because of what, because of the eyes that we have been trained, that we have and, that, and trained to look at, at certain things. But let us assume that there, the broad social movement is, is not there or it is quiescent. And then ask ourselves the question, okay, um, where do we look uh, to find it? <coughs> And uh, I would just say to you, where do we look to find it, and 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 what, and if we find it, what are its struggles? If they indeed they are they are they are struggles. And here I'm speaking specifically of the Anglophone uh, Caribbean. I cannot answer that question. Um, I have spent, some of you may know, the last two years. Um, basically almost two weeks every month in one Caribbean island um, doing a certain kind, doing a project which would have tied me to um, a certain kind of politics and political understanding. And even spending all that great amount of time, I myself have not yet found, formed a definitive opinion about uh, in response to this particular uh, question. However, I think spending that time has also opened certain things to me, which I would just want to share. One of them is to think about how does Im imperial power expresses itself today. And uh, usually those of us, you know, 70s, 80s, and so on, you know, foreign ownership of e economy, that's there. Um, you know, uh, the ways in which uh, questions of sovereignty, 
are, um, are, are, trub are troubled by imperial dictates, um, particularly if you're in, if, if in an American uh, backyard. But also, I think that there is a, another way in which imperial power operates, which is much more subtle, <coughs> and which we do not necessarily pay attention to. And this is the actual international financial system. And we take it, you know, we just kind of take it for granted. But one of the things that struck me in the, and that struck me in the Caribbean in the last two years is the debt crisis for the entire region. We have had it there before and so on. But when you have a situation, and you look at the IMF numbers, of the countries of the region where, in, where you, know, you have things like general government gross de 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 GDP debt of Dominica is 102.8%. Um, Jamaica is 86.2%. It is over 100%. It has gone down. Then what you are looking at is the way in which the financial control, multilateral uh, financial control, of and government control, multilateral and, and um, as well as uh, uh, bilateral debt, as time is any understanding of what it is, quote unquote, economic development and social development may, might look like. <coughs> to the extent where in the Jamaican Constitution there is now a line that says that our debt cannot be over a certain percentage in your constitution, right? Which then suggests to me that what you are looking at is that um, besides extractivism, um, and tourism is an extractive industry, um, besides extractivism, what you're looking at is the kind of nebulous financial things that nobody can put their hands on um, immediately and say this is what is happening. And that a government can come to you and say, well, listen, we, our debt ratio is X, so guess what? We can't spend on schools, we can't spend on health, we can't spend on this, we can't spend on that, which almost sounds like logical arguments. Right? Or that they will come and say to you, we have to pay it down very quickly because the agreements we have is means that you have to pay it at a certain rate and so on. So this question, therefore, of how the uh, how imperial power works today, I think becomes really important in trying to think about. Um, and, and it is not just a, you know, I mean, there was a whole moment in the 1980s when there was a thing about the commercial debt and the collapse of Citibank and so on and so forth. But now the multilateral and the bilateral debt, I would want to argue, is so insidious that it becomes extremely, it becomes and people, difficult for people to try and put their ordinary person to put their, 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 their actual um, hands, hands on it. The other way I would want to, the other thing I would want to say, just, just one thing about imperial power, the other thing I would want to say is, is that, is, um, is, is this, but is this, that what to me is also interesting around the, the in the Anglophone, in Anglophone Caribbean um, today, is uh, something that Professor Meeks wrote about years ago. Um, David Scott mentioned it. I myself have written about it. Um, but that there is a collapse now, not just of legitimacy or, or from the top, but there is actually a, a collapse of legitimacy, what some of us would call subaltern hegemony from the bottom. And that therefore the, both, both those collapses have created um, real crisis. The way I like to explain it is that if in the Caribbean and here in particular Jamaica, there was what one would call the logic of affliction and people who were poor and oppressed considered themselves sufferers. Today, nobody considers themselves a sufferer. Everybody says, we have to chop. And what does chopping mean? Chopping means that you chop the line. And how do you chop the line? You chop it through scam, you chop it through extortion, you chop it through crime. And, and those of you who follow the Jamaican news, um, last week there were two major bank robbers um, in one, in one, in one, in one, in one, uh, one small city, the city of Portmore, and the, th the last one was particularly important. Um, there were two cars, uh, um, two full loads of cars, uh, young men in Toyotas, and the second one was uh, they were had they all had submachine guns. <coughs> 
um, which, which opens up a different space, in my view, for organization and thinking about what does Chaplin mean. And the videos I got were, was interesting. Well, the videos I got were from people who were taking pictures of this, um, of, the, of the robbery. I mean, you can do that these days on your phone and send it around. But what was interesting was how people were discussing this as an act of chopping, right? And, 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 and what, you know, and calling it chopping, which is, you know, as I said, chopping, actually chopping the line. And so that the, uh, the shift from this logic of affliction um, to, and people consider themselves sufferers to this idea of, uh, of chopping, which includes all sorts of other activities, I think is something that one wants to, something that we want to pay, pay attention to. Because in the end, I would want to then argue that what you're looking at is, um, is that you then, you then get a situation where there's a creation of what I call fragmented sovereignties. And the case where fragmented sovereignty is, is most acute is actually Haiti. Um, and, and the way in which the city of Port-au-Prince and the environs is constructed with <coughs> so-called quote-unquote um, gangs. I'm saying all of these things because I'm fortunate I would not be here for the second time, for the second round, because I have to, be, I have to, I have to go and teach, um, teach, teach a class. The final thing I would say, as Chair, is, is, is that in all of this, and Meeks makes a gesture to this, is what it is that is required and, and, uh, or might be required. And I use the word might with a lot of underlined um, because I don't think people should, I don't think experts should dictate what goes on, particularly when you're thousands of miles away should go on in, in, in any country. You have very tentative opinions. And, and I think that the way in what one of the things that is as a Kurt that people have been saying and in the discussion, various discussion groups that I've been engaging is, and Brian Meeks makes a lot of this in his work, is this business of democracy. And so what does democracy look like? Um, and to me, that is the, that, the real question that faces the Caribbean. Um, with loss of legitimacy from the top and the bottom, right? with the imperial power that is insidious and almost unseen, then the question of, of, of certain kind of radical, of any kind of uh, progressive politics, in my view, then becomes rooted in what kind of democratic forms are you going to have? And how are you going to deal with um, democracy? I, and, and how are you going to enhance, enhance democracy? I want to end with something Professor Meeks writes 21st century revolutionary transnational movements, he says, is an entirely different problem space. Might wish nonetheless to learn from while not being transfixed by the tragedies of history. I would just put tragedies in quotation marks, but that's, that's fine. And instead draw inspiration from the archive of revolution. For me, the archive of revolution, and this is what this series is about, is also is not just about the big moments of revolution, but it is also about the quotidian and the everyday practices of ordinary people as they try to make a life for themselves, um, and that therefore any struggles that we are thinking about also has to attach themselves to those efforts to make a, a life for themselves in the middle of this mess that has been created by imperial powers. Thanks very much, and thanks for the book, Brian. I mean, if nothing else, you're going to want to buy all of the books in the Pluto series. And also, <coughs> uh, I think that is a fabulous setup to the import of this book. Um, all of the threads that are o overlapping and urgent in this moment. So uh, Professor Meeks, the author, and Aaron, see, now you messed me up because you told me how to say it. And now, OK. Um, <laughs> Kamgisha. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> are going to engage in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Professor Meeks is a professor of Africana Studies at Brown. He's published many books and edited collections, including Critical Interventions in Caribbean Politics and Theory, which is from 2014, Narratives of Resistance, Jamaica, Trinidad, and the Caribbean, which is from 2000, and Caribbean Revolutions in Revolutionary Theory, an assessment of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Grenada, 1992. His novel, Paint the Town Red, was published in 2003, and his volume of poems, he's a Renaissance man, right? The Ku Clock Clicks was published in 2018. Aaron Kamgisha is the Ruth Simmons Professor of Africana Studies at Smith College and the author of Beyond Coloniality, Citizenship, and Freedom in the Caribbean Intellectual Freedom. In the Caribbean Intellectual Freedom? Tradition. In the in the Caribbean intellectual tradition, and the editor of seven edited collections and six special issues of journals on Caribbean and Africana thought. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to the two of you. Thanks, Noliwe. And um, I'm going to say a couple of opening remarks. And then Aaron and I are going to engage in a conversation. If this works out. I agree with it. If it doesn't work out, it's Aaron's idea. <laughs> but we're going to try. Uh, so um, thank you, Tony, for that sort of framing and introduction. And thank you, on, uh, Bedor Alagra, for your Black Critique series in which the book appears. Thank the entire team at Pluto, um, a radical press in uh, London, um, quite remarkable history, for considering it worthwhile. Thanks to my colleagues in and out of Africana Studies at Brown, um, Noliwe for chairing, um, and I see one or two others of my colleagues here. Thanks for coming, um, and for everybody who is here. Um, thanks to Aaron Kamgisha from Smith College, but formerly like me from the University of the West Indies for finding his way from Massachusetts via complex train routes to get here. And last but far from least, my wife, Patsy Lewis, for extraordinary but not unusual intellectual support and encouragement as the ideas for the book took shape and form through the long COVID night days and nights. Thank you, Patsy. Some books begin with clear and detailed plans. Hypotheses are established. Chapters and sequences are laid out. Funding is secured. And then over a very defined period of time, the manuscript is drafted. There may be many more stages before the book appears of editing, cutting, and pasting, extending, and contracting various sections. But the overall approach is one of a clear project written and published in a defined period of time. This, however, is not such a well-defined book and has followed a somewhat more meandering, convoluted path. I've been thinking for some time to write a book reflecting on a number of critical thinkers, activists, and scholars who inhabited the space of my growing up, the post-colonial Caribbean of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, in order to better understand its atmosphere, mood, and zeitgeist, and why those first post-colonial decades followed their own parlous path, uh, roots. And this original conception was supposed to have been a bigger work involving perhaps eight to 10 chapters. At the same time, over the past decade, I've had another book in mind, developing and moving beyond a study I published in 2007 called Envisioning Caribbean Futures, Jamaican Perspectives. Envisioning, as I suggested in this volume, was produced in a moment of stasis when the Caribbean impetus towards radical change had ebbed but there was as yet no counterflowing tide, either regionally or globally, on which to think and imagine more expansive, capacious futures. The uprisings of 2019 and the George Floyd global protests of 2020 were, as I argue in the introduction, a bend in history's river and the moment in which we need to abandon the defensive, even pessimistic thinking of the recent past and begin to think in earnest and more positively about the outlines and contours of a better world. 
So with the urgency of what I thought was the need to get these ideas out there and to encourage a new conversation around Caribbean futures, I began to think, aided no doubt by the forced quarantining of the COVID years, why not combine the two notions into one? I already, already had written for different purposes and at different times, the Edna Manley and George Lamming chapters. Small Axe's wonderful seminar in the Jamaican 70s had given me the opportunity to reflect on my own poetry, and I had been thinking and writing about Stuart Hall and his role, or lack thereof, in Caribbean politics around the time of his passing in 2014. Why not combine these with work I had begun to do on the Trumpian years? the parlous state of Caribbean politics, and again, Stuart Hall's own reflections on alternative futures for the British state into a two-part volume. The first part, remembering, looking back on the post-colonial era. The second, imagining both a stock-taking of the present moment and the opening of a long-shuttered portal to the future. What was missing was a conclusion, but then I considered this was not a moment for endings, so why not end on a note of hope, which ultimately is the foundation and scaffolding on which any project of human <coughs> liberation must inevitably be built. So the final chapter turned out to be from a paper I was writing to explain a difference I had been trying to resolve with my friend David Scott's book on the Haitian Revolution, Conscripts of Modernity, and his subsequent reflection on the Grenadian Revolution, Omens of Adversity, both of which elaborate his notion of the tragic sensibility. Scott's arguments, unsurprisingly, possessed rich insights, but left me in the end somewhat depressed and rudderless. Ironically, this ran counter to my reading of C.L.R. James' magnificent study, The Black Jacobins, and the chapter seeks to think about that book and James differently and to remember the unleashed human possibilities that James invoked in the Black Jap Jacobins, and how we can think about these as inspirational foundations for the more engaged forms of political struggle in the Caribbean that are bound to come. After the post-colonial Caribbean is quite in evidently not a political economy text. It is definitely not a set of well-defined policy proposals to be implemented point by point. Nor, on the contrary, is it a theoretical text with a high degree of abstraction, only hinting at the foundations for future practice. Rather, as I see it, it is an early meditation on what we can begin to think about as the post-colonial past, followed by a series of gestures and sketches suggesting the barest outlines of possible emancipatory futures. So that is the book and its history in miniature except for the cover. Myself and my wife, Patsy Lewis, bought the etching on plexiglass, Le Royaume de ce monde, the kingdom of this world, from Edouard Duval Carrier, when he visited Brown's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, some years before COVID struck. Can't remember how many years, because COVID um, distorts time. Um, some years before COVID struck. The piercing eyes, as Edward told me in response to my query, were those of the witness, T. Noel, in Allegio Carpentier's iconic, if contested, novel of the same title. And below T. Noel's gaze is Christophe's magnificent fortress, La Ferriere. What better way, I thought, to capture the power and majesty, the will to be free of the revolutionary anti-colonial moment, yet simultaneously the dangers and uncertainties that lie along any path of radical transformation than to try to portray graphically the history of the first post-colony. IET, we must always remember, was named in a profound gesture of generosity by self-liberated African people in honor of the decimated first inhabitants of the Central Caribbean island. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Indeed. Uh, yes, so um, it's good to be back at Brown. The first time that, and the only other time that I have been at Brown was actually at uh, Professor Bogues' invitation to um, apply to the Biari program in 2009. So I would like to thank him for that. And I'd like to thank Brian and everyone else who's made this particular trip possible. Now, um, 
Brian and I have known each other for over 20 years. I believe we either met at the CLR James Centenary Conference or it may have been the CSA in 2001 in St. Martin, one of the two of those, I forget which one. Uh, but certainly he is the most prolific political scientist of his generation in the Anglophone Caribbean. And as many books, and I have all of the single offered books right here, you know, well thumbed and stuff. No, I didn't just buy them from the campus bookstore. Um, <laughs> and this is not even to include the many edited collections that he has produced, certainly a test. And so he's made a very decisive intervention in theorizing the character of the Caribbean post-colonial state. And for scholars of my generation, telling the history of the radical Caribbean from the 1960s to the 1980s. Yet, however, his most decisive and distinctive contribution, one which has become more and more discernible in his work over the, the arc of his work over these years, has been for me as an exemplary theorist of Anglophone Caribbean political culture. Okay? And by Caribbean political culture, I should say, I very decidedly do not mean an area of such study that is a subset of cultural studies, but rather a tremendous multidisciplinary engagement with the Caribbean social sciences and humanities to ferret out what we understand the armada, what we understand about this armada of political forms, options, and consciousness um, that we see in Caribbean people over time and space. So um, in suggesting that we have a dialogue here, I have crafted seven questions that I want to ask Brian. And yes, it is my fault if this does not work out very well. Okay. Um, but, and I'm going to get to them, but I first want to make a couple of comments about the introduction to this book. So there's a point on page 20 in which after reviewing four scholars' recent work on the question of sovereignty and the Caribbean political, and those four scholars are Lyndon Lewis, Deborah Thomas, Yaramar Bonilla, and myself, um, Brian suggests, and I quote, however, beyond asserting a set of new and critically important ethical principles, there is in all a relative silence or hesitance as to what comes next, end quote. And so his position seems to be that these four offers shy away from a direct engagement with state power and indeed the potential capture of this power. Uh, so to give you another quote, what appears to be missing is a necessary and equally robust parallel conversation on how to imagine, construct, and fight for a new politics alongside the essentially philosophical and theoretical effort present in abundance here to think about its guiding ethos. And it's certainly a characterization of my text, I will not speak for the others, that I actually agree with. Um, and um, there are certain urgent questions that he asks us about reconstructing the political order in the region. He lists 10, they're all important. Um, uh, you're going to all read them because you're all going to buy the book, of course. Um, but I just want to list them quickly for you before I get into my questions. So the first one is questioning an economy based on extractivism. The second is the health system, or the idea of these two models of private and public systems. And these are all about reconstructing the political and social order of the Caribbean region. Okay. The third is a question of educational system and the elite versus non-elite schools um, uh, and the whole question of the, the kind of legacies of colonial education. The fourth are women's rights and LGBTQ issues. Fifth, reparations and our relationship to Pan-Africanism. Sixth, the question of racism in the contemporary Caribbean. Seventh, Caribbean diasporas and their relationship to home. Eighth, the question of the indigenous Caribbean. Ninth, a political forum beyond Westminster and the question of a borderless region and world. And tenth, how to think beyond capitalism. And I think that the marvel of this book is, is that um, Brian manages to address and touch on practically all of these issues and give us something of value to think with on practically all of these issues. So my first question for um, Brian would be this. How do you perceive after the post-colonial Caribbean as a development and extension of the work that you've been doing for the last 20 years? An easy one to get started. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aaron. And I, I feel as though I'm sitting SATs 
uh, again. But let, let me try anyway uh, by saying that it, it, it's definitely an organic extension of work I've been doing because, you know, this, this sort of um, sanko for like looking backward to look uh, forward um, is, is what Caribbean history has always been about, what the historical project has been about. But I've also been very conscious um, in late middle age of recognizing that my own history, um, the history of the post-colonial, um, the first post-colonial generation, so to speak, um, is very critical itself on its own grounds in helping us to understand and the extent to which you can tell history from a, a first-person perspective, of course, always relying on the archives as well, um, is going to be very important, you know, assessing what succeeded, what failed, um, what, um, and therefore, hopefully, where we need to go. So that has always been a part of it, but at least since 2007 and envisioning Caribbean futures, I've been concerned about the fact that, you know, we, we hesitate to, to play our strokes and for, forgive the cricket references to all who don't know this wonderful imperial sport. But we hesitate to play our strokes and we, we hold back from them because, of course, there's a danger in, in trying to imagine the future, particularly if you, if you come out of a social sciences tradition, tradition which is empirical um, and, you know, large, in that respect, largely British, I imagine, and not French, um, in which you, you know, any statement you make has to be justified by, by the numerical evidence as well as the archival evidence. And uh, looking into the future is dangerous because, you know, you, you need to t play your shots freely. And um, so, I, you know, what this book is, is an extension of that work. My first book, um, you know, try to review the, the Cuban, Nicaraguan, and Grenadian revolutions um, comparatively, um, looking back on Grenada and Nicaragua, and of course Cuba is still very much there. Um, um, and my the Envisioning Caribbean Futures in 2007 th sought to think about the future. Um, I, I th and, and this book, in a sense, draws on what I think is the changes in the world that have occurred since 2007, the crash of 2008, 9, and the upwellings, uh, if you want to say uprisings, of uh, 2019, 20, which demand that we think beyond the, the, the neoliberal agenda. It demands that we put, bring the elephant into the room, which is capitalism, and call it by name, and not, not just thinking about neoliberalism, <coughs> which is essentially a phase, a moment in capitalism, mm -hmm. as opposed to the big question itself. The Guadeloupians and Martinicans, when they rose up in 2009, called it profitation. But what they were referring to was the bigger system. Mm -hmm. And it, so I'm saying that, that is essentially this book, therefore, is both intimately connected with how I've been thinking and an extension of that thought. Indeed. <clears throat> and I'm glad that you mentioned the Envisioning Caribbean Futures book because um, <clears throat> in chapter six of this work, you actually counterpose your 2007 manifesto in Envisioning Caribbean Futures and read it with um, and in light of Stuart Hall and all's anti-neoliberalism Kilburn manifesto. And in Envisioning Caribbean Futures, you're very clear that the proposals are based on the specific conjuncture faced by Jamaica in the first decade of the 21st century, um, and you limit your claims in terms of thinking about extending them further to the rest of the Caribbean. But I am bound to ask, does Jamaica have a Caribbean future? Or to put it differently, if the deepening of interregional cooperation and integration is a continuous a never refuted argument made by the radical intelligentsia of the Caribbean, then how do solutions that proffer immediately to territorial or diasporic specific initiatives, like a constituent assembly of the Jamaican people at home and, broad, and abroad, how do they work within a regional logic? Well, okay, um, it's a good question. 
And um, let me say that I wrote that book initially when not wrote it. I, I <coughs> conceived that book as a pan-Caribbean venture mm -hmm. that would look at a number of different spaces. And um, by the time I got around to looking at Jamaica, I had a book-length manuscript. Mm -hmm. So there was a sort of urgency to get it done. And I said, look, um, let me do the Jamaican side of that envisioning, perhaps as either uh, impetus and impetus for me to do the bigger study or for other people to begin thinking about futures and to take up the baton and run with it. So I, I always, I, I never conceived it as a totality, but a, a, a regional example, mm -hmm. which could then be extended. Just start thinking about futures. And in fact, um, after we're finished here and we have a break, we're going to have a discussion in this very room with a number of colleagues and friends who are going to be asking that very question. Indeed. Wither the Caribbean. Um, and the, the reason I'm insistent upon it and have been at least for myself is that um, not enough people are asking it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can talk about the budget um, and, and how much you're going to put in the budget next, next um, month. They can talk about people being, um, you know, shot and the murder rate and so on and so forth. All essential questions. But, you know, our horizon is essentially um, one year, two years, and not the sort of 50-year horizon that is absolutely essential. Indeed. Indeed. And um, my next question or discussion topic relates to the whole issue of historicizing the radical Caribbean. And as I've said, I've learned very much from um, your work on this over the years. Um, and again, in after the post-colonial Caribbean, there's a particular story of Anglophone Caribbean independence from 1962 onwards, the heightened period of radicalism from 1968 to 1983. But there is a moment that actually isn't flagged as much. And that is in 1953 and the overthrow of the government of Chedi Jagan in Guyana. And uh, I've wondered over time, and in many ways, I use the same schema in some of my own work. Okay, so this is an autocritique, um, I very much too. But I'm wondering what would it mean instead to shift this discussion of Caribbean post colonial politics back a decade? and consider more closely the ways in which the conditions for both post-colonial misrule were set in the late colonial period's last decades, and also um, some moments which allow us to understand uh, uh, or trace a particular conservatism within the Caribbean politics from that period of time onwards. Um, because Guyana in 1953 is centrally important, not just for understanding this post-colonial tra trajectory of that country, but also for assessing post-World War II Cold War politics and the conservative turn in the region that are going to reach their apogee in the 1980s. So I was just wondering if we don't need to go back a decade um, earlier. Um, which may seem counterintuitive because, of course, the first ca Anglophone Caribbean countries to get their independence are in 1962. But we know the terrain of post-colonial politics are really have, are more or less in place after universal adult suffrage and in the very late colonial order or the last decade before independence. So I just want to proffer that to you as something. Well, I can only say yeah. that I agree with you um, mm -hmm. and that if I had to write it again, I would have to include... Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a prior chapter that goes back to 1953. Undoubtedly, mm -hmm. what you say is absolutely true. I use 62, which is a year of Trinidadian and Jamaican independence and the breakup of the Federation, because it is, uh, a, it is an important marker. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the overthrow of the Cheddar Jagan government in, in Guyana and the, the history of Guyana, which followed from that, and how that influenced the entire region, um, is critically important. I can only say, mm -hmm. um, let's talk about it, and let's let's you know in our joint, not in our joint work, but in our <coughs> separate works, consider that as an important point that we should think about. Indeed, indeed, yeah. So, um, your work has been very centrally concerned with theorizing Caribbean radical traditions. Uh, again, this may seem counterintuitive, but I want to ask a different question here. Is there a discernible tradition that we might call Caribbean conservative thought? Okay, 
And I'll explain this. You know, um, I was prompted by a colleague, um, well, a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, when it was putting together those two volumes on Caribbean um, political thought. Well, are you going to have anything on Caribbean conservative thought? And I was there, no. <laughs> uh, because, as I said, I don't think that they are any um, Edmund Burks in the Caribbean in terms of figures who have actually made um, a great contribution to something that we might call conservative thought, however we critique that. I mean, I said most of the Caribbean conservative thinkers are really more or less apologists for local and global, global authority. Perfect. That was how I responded to that friend. The friend was um, a person whose work we would all know in here, Peter Hudson of you know, um, Bankers and Empire. But I've started to wonder and rethink about that, uh, think about that a bit more. Um, because we've come to th think about the Caribbean intellectual tradition through the eyes of its radicals. It's linked to what Cedric Robinson would term the black radical tradition. And this radical tradition has been very important to access um, for many reasons, um, given its search for human freedom beyond coloniality. We know this as an ongoing and urgent question. And this quest, of course, has not dissolved. But if we're thinking about the fundamental features of Caribbean conservative thought, what might they be? I'd like to suggest that there are few. Um, a hermeneutics of suspicion towards any idea of progress or liberation. A willed refusal or studied indifference towards a black radical tradition or African cultural presence in the Americas. An embrace of a Euro-American modernity at the abs absence of a little tradition of the region. And I think that we are actually can see some of this in a number of figures. The first one we immediately think of, of course, is V.S. Naipaul, okay? Um, but some of Orlando Patterson's work can be profitably cathetted into this category, as some, some of the late 1960s and early 1970s Derek Walcott. But it also, and if we think beyond the Anglophone Caribbean here, we can go to figures in Haitian thought like the 19th century thinker Demisvar Delorme, whose work I recently encountered, um, his Les Theories Theory au Sciences au Pevoir, an 1870 text from um, Haiti, a 766 page text, in which he argues that political power should reside in the intellectual elite. And he makes this whole long argument going all the way back to ancient Greece and bringing it forward. Um, the reason why I'm suggesting this is not that we are becoming Caribbean conservatives, huh? but I mean, um, I'm wondering if Caribbean conservative thought may give us a more textured understanding of the longer history of Caribbean intellectual history, and particularly allow us to understand something about neglected periods like the late 19th century and the very early 20th century, which we neglect in part because we find the thought of key figures here to be embarrassingly colonial, not suitably anti-colonial enough. And I think that in Caribbean literary studies, there has been this move um, towards rethinking the generations beyond and before Windrush, okay, by a number of theorists. And I'm wondering if that's a move that we also need to take in the study of Caribbean intellectual history and in Caribbean political thought. Absolutely, and well said. Um, you know, there, there's a place for that. Um, there's not a place for that in my book, mm -hmm. because my book mm -hmm. is about oh, no, no, the radical no. tradition, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's more so its weaknesses than its strengths, because mm -hmm. um, it, in the generation after the 1960s, it failed. And therefore, the question is, why did, it, why, why did a movement aiming to complete the emancipatory hope of emancipation mm -hmm. of, um, of the 1930s labor rebellions, um, and which inherited those traditions of, of liberation essentially failed. So I mean, my, my concern was, was um, uh, a sort of self-examination mm -hmm. of those movements. But um, is, there, is there need and a place for a, a careful mapping and understanding of conservative traditions? Um, absolutely. Um, and if we consider, I mean, just to you know, go back to my own um, country, think about Edward Siaga and the Jamaica Labor Party, um, a, a party on the one hand rooted in a labor tradition, but um, 
dominated by a certain um, loosely defined conservative agenda which moves between a sort of extreme reactionary position and a more moderate conservative position. We need to understand these movements and, and their characteristics in, in great detail. We need to think of, of you know, the sort of Cuban tradition um, and, and what Miami is and um, consider, consider that as another pole of conservatism, um, which we need to reflect on. Um, I have a short life and limited energy and focus, mm. and that is not my energy <laughs> and focus. Indeed, indeed. But I do think mm. that it is worthwhile of consideration. Indeed, indeed, yes. Um, I want to go from here to um, the engagement that you have with David Scott, uh, which I think is a fascinating engagement. I mean, I've been tracking it over the years. Um, I think that the series of engagements began with Scott's 1995 Social and Economic Studies essay on revolution, uh, which was in part a response to your first book. And it's interesting to me thinking about conscripts of modernity, the fact that there haven't been as many rejoinders by Caribbeanists to conscripts of modernity as one might think. Um, there is Paget's very um, profound and well-written, well, I don't know anything by Paget, which is not very profound and well-written, um, uh, uh, review of the book in the CLR James Journal back in 2007. Um, and I also have had my own um, take on the profitable nature, but also the concerns that I had with um, conscripts of modernity. I mean, I very much admire what Scott is trying to do in terms of th taking a very great Caribbean text and using it to think about the current moment, you know, and doing a, this long and very steady reading with it. You know, I'm very much there with the idea of doing that. But um, in my own reading of James in the 1950s, 60s period, in which he's crafting all of these revisions and the epilogue to Black Jacobins, I have never considered that James's work here takes a definitive turn towards the tragic. Um, I mean, I think that's one aspect of his work. Okay, this is the point, you know, which may sound very empirical, but it's very true also. Um, I think that there is a larger, more compelling consideration in James of this time, a kind of pondering excitement at the possibilities of a Caribbean on the cusp of independence. And of course, if we're going to go to cricket, I see it very much in Beyond the Boundary. I mean, Beyond the Boundary is all about that particular yearning for of the productivity of yes, a male Caribbean body, not on the field of play, but beyond the boundary. And that's why you see that incredible epilogue um, after the 1960-61 series, for those who've read it, when James talks about the batting of sobers at Brisbane and how it was one of the most beautiful sights he had ever seen, and about the command and control of the batsman, not only of the bowling, but of himself. Mm -hmm. He seemed to be expressing a personal vision. All of that is right there in um, Beyond the Boundary, which has always given me pause about um, not just the argument that Scott is making, but the way in which that argument has been taken up by people who are not reading James at all, okay? Um, but then secondly also, there is that argument that Scott is making um, about anti-colonial theorists and this idea mm -hmm. of romantic anti-colonialism. And it's a puzzle to me, and it's a puzzle that I think that you pick up on and you speak on um, very well in your work. Because um, when you look at James, Césaire, and Fanon, um, I think they all see very clearly the possibilities of tragedy in the post-colonial moment. Okay, that's the reason why Fanon actually writes The Pitfalls of National mm -hmm. Consciousness mm -hmm. in The Wretched mm -hmm. of the Earth. But they are concerned, okay, they are... Concern is not the right word. Um, their aim and ambition is to fight beyond that mm -hmm. and craft a vision mm -hmm. beyond that. So, um, I mean, when you look at Césaire, we've all read lots of Césaire in this room. Huh? Um, but I recently found that lovely essay by Césaire, The Responsibility of the Artist, which was present, which was published in Présence Africaine in February, March of 1959. You know, and just to give you a moment, the very first paragraph, okay? Um, Césaire, we are at a solemn moment, the moment when colonialism is not dead, alas, 
but at any rate already knows itself to be mortal. Colonialism is still able to crush and oppress, perhaps more savagely than ever. One thing is sure, however, it is mortally wounded, it knows it is perishable, and has lost its historical assurance. And Césaire goes on from there to talk constantly about that question of the watchfulness we need to have and the responsibility of the artist and what the artist actually has to do for the wider community. And I'm not going to read further on mm -hmm. in Césaire um, here, but um, there is, just to give you parts of that very last um, a uh, paragraph of it. Above and beyond present day struggles, bounded as they are by circumstances, this is what we want, a world rejuvenated and, bal and balanced. Um, then and only then will we have conquered and our final victory will mark the coming of a new era. We will have contributed meaning to the most misused and yet the most glorious of words. We will have helped found universal humanism. So um, I've always been puzzled by that particular argument. Um, and uh, that Scott is making. And I found um, the discussion that you have is one of the most pointedly concerned with Caribbean radical futures mm -hmm. of all of the engagements of Scott on this particular question. And um, in the context of 2020 and onwards of the possibility of clearing what you called a foundation for radical optimism. And there's a point in which um, you borrow from Lenin's description of a revolutionary situation as one in which the ruling classes are not being able to continue ruling in the old way to suggest that this may very well be the situation today. But I um, want to press you a bit on this. Um, I feel at one moment somewhat doubtful. Um, as I was just saying just before we started, we have had in the last two weeks two of the three biggest bank failures by assets in U.S. history, which seem to have barely registered as a blip on the public consciousness. And um, I'm just wondering about, do you think quite, though, that we have the foundation for radical optimism at this moment based on what is actually happening and the trajectory even of the last two years um, post George Floyd's murder, rather than the fact, which I would agree with, that yeah. we have to continually strive for it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. I mean, that's a wonderful and um, really rich and multifaceted question. Let me first start with David um, and let me express extraordinary respect for the work he's been trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, you know, I see a few anthropologists in the room, so most of you may very well know Scott's work. Um, but uh, what I think is the, the great success of conscripts and of omens of adversity which follows mm -hmm. is the question of establishing this notion of the problem space. And I think the notion of the problem space is a sort of meta-theoretical attempt to recognize that as we move through time, things change, and, and, and therefore the sets of things that we're looking at change from time to time. And I think this is, this, 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 either it's very simple and obvious, or it's a major theoretical breakthrough. For the time being, I'd like to consider it a major theoretical breakthrough. Having said that, um, Scott then establishes this notion of, um, the, the, of, of tragedy um, without giving it that same fleetness of foot that he gives to the notion of the problem space. That is, time and space change, and therefore the new problem spaces arise. And the extent to which a problem space has value in one moment may not and may yet not have the same value in another. And then there's also the question as to whether or not we can silo problem spaces, or as I suggest in the book, whether s problem spaces leak into each other. Mm -hmm. That is to say that a problem space may not be pure and may not be defined by the fact that everything within it is self-contained, but that it also contains some of the old problems as well as the new problems that are arising as we move through time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just want to say, first of all, that I, I, I respect the work he's doing. But ultimately, I, I, th this notion of, 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 uh, of uh, 
tragic sensibility. I, I reject. I, I, but at the same time, I rescue from it the notion of us walking with a sensitivity to tragedy. Mm -hmm. That is to say that we don't live with a tragic sensibility, but we recognize that things can go south all the time. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we begin to think about how we move forward. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I try to modify him. I also try to differentiate Scott in one of my footnotes um, from um, um, Afro-pessimism. Afro -pessimism, yes. And I, I, I try to make it clear that Scott's, Scott's agenda is not the agenda of Afro-pessimism mm -hmm. um, very distinctly. So that's in relation to Scott, in relation to the times we live in. But absolutely, what you're saying is that the financial thing is, is crumbling down. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, we just got out of 2009 and now we're faced with a new crisis, you know, and those of us with, with pensions are, 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 you know, biting our fingernails because we're fortunate to have pensions, but they may not be worth as much as they were worth a week ago, et cetera, et cetera. This is what a crisis looks like. We're living in it. Mm -hmm. And there are two dimensions to that. One is the actual uh, mechanical crisis of the system. And the other is how people react and respond to it. And what, this, is, this is why I, I place such importance on 2019 and its follow-up, 2020, 2019, which was a global upwelling, um, unprecedented since 1968, and surpassing 1968 in many respects. Um, it's kind of came and went, and uh, you know, because COVID followed on its heels, we've lost a sense of what it was and its scale. Mm. Right? In other words, um, this notion of quiescence that inhabits Scott, Scott's tragic um, you know, sensibility and, um, you know, and, and tragic moment is passing. Mm. Right? Um, and it's, it's also passing with a new form of global struggle, which is um, quite different from 1968, mm -hmm. but which has not run its course and cannot run its course because the structural crisis of a system is there for us to see as present in what you're describing right mm -hmm. away. So we're, we're, I, I, think, I think we're moving into a, a global revolutionary moment, mm -hmm. um, which need not necessarily um, end in revolution. It could end in um, a dissolution of the world as we know it. I don't think it is business as usual. That much I'm clear on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the question is, um, what, what words, what concept, what theories that compel us to consider them as being serious and taken seriously? Are we building and constructing to meet the moment um, because I think the moment is on us, and a moment is not a year or a day, it's a period, um, you know, to, 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 to revert to the old Marxist language. It's an epoch, right? Uh, and we're in an epoch, uh, and uh, we're in a different place than we were when um, Margaret Thatcher was telling Ronnie, we, telling Ronnie Reagan, we won. We're out of that problem space, mm -hmm. out of that epoch. And the one that we're into is yet to be fully defined. But what are, what are we thinking about as to the kind of world that we want to meet this moment? What are its elements? Not just its general features, but its elements. And uh, those were my 10 points in the beginning as, as questions to think about. Indeed. And when you speak about theories, that goes right okay, in. We, we, need, we need to... Oh, we're, to, to we're close to wrap up. <gasps> okay. Indeed. <laughs> yes. We do. Okay, so I'll ask one question. My last two, I'll ask as one, and then I'll be finished. So um, when you talk about theories, um, the question would be on... Uh, the recent work on racial capitalism and the upsurge in interest in the category yeah. of racial capitalism. Um, um, how do you help us see this helping us discern the political economy of contemporary Caribbean racism? Mm 
And joining on that, on the question of a socialist project in the Caribbean, um, you suggest in the work that um, we need to think beyond capitalism so reasons are undeniable as they are salutary. However, you don't actually ever suggest a socialist alternative, okay? Or even moving gradually towards a socialist alternative. So I just wanted to put that to you as the last question. So yeah, well, well I, I do. And yep. I disagree with you. Oh, okay. I, I think, mm -hmm. I think yep. that my entire engagement with Stuart Hall and the Kilburn Manifesto mm -hmm. is the beginning of trying to sketch the outlines of what a different kind of economy would okay. look like. Right. No, and, 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 and actually, Hall and team et al. Use, use, they, they argue it's not the control of the state over people but it's control of people over the state. Mm -hmm. He inverts the 20th century notion of a central state, um, a command state, and he suggests a kind of state in which the people are intimately involved in the uh, inner workings of its decisions. So it's not an anarchic position because there is a state. But, and so, so I'm beginning to untangle that, and in fact, I actually use a, fail, a phase drawn from the Jamaican um, reggae singer, Burning Spear, mm -hmm. social living, yes. to refer to uh, a Caribbean notion of, of socialism. Indeed, indeed. Okay, yeah. All right. So, questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> yes. I'm seeing Tony here. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but a mic, Tony. Uh, because I have to teach. Um, thanks, uh, thanks to both of you. I want to uh, push back, Brian, a bit on your thing about revolution. Um, and I want to. Uh, it's, on. it's on. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to ask whether or not we are um, not. And I'm here using the Gramscian phrase. If we're not at an interregnum. In other words, the old is dying, but it has not died, which is why, you know, I mean, you know, you, we all talk about bank failures and so on. I'm, I'm thinking very much of the Caribbean, and on the Anglophone Caribbean in particular, and the, the ideas in, that, uh, in the Caribbean and how people are thinking through struggle. Um, so that if the old is dying, but not yet dead, it's not on its deathbed, but the new is not yet born. That moment of ignoregnum is when morbid forms appear. Hmm. And, and, and if morbid forms appear, then you're looking at fascism, not mm. just looking at authoritarian populism, which Stuart would have talked about in, in the first um, version of his idea of neoli neoliberalism, revolution. And so I want to push back on that to say that perhaps we are not, there's not a global revolution, but that we are in this moment of interregnum in which there is, um, is what I said, the whole has not died and the, the new mm -hmm. has not yet been born and morbid. But that in that period, there is tremendous contestation. Oh. And the question of contestation is not now so much, not so much around um, economics or even yeah. politics, but is actually around so-called co culture. In other words, there is the, there's a deep ideological fight, um, which is both in the Caribbean Right, about what is responsible and individual and so on and so forth. And in this country, it's about what you can read and what you can't read. Right? Yeah. Because the question is of a horizon. And the anxieties of the rich, of the elite, is about that, is about what is it that, how, if this thing has been fractured by black lives and Occupy and so on and so forth, what then, how do we catch that back? How do we, how do we recreate? and make sure that the system continues. Yeah. So that just to say that, I push back yeah, a bit. Yeah. I hear you say global, and I kind of push back, because yeah, I, yeah. I think, no, I'm not sure. We're not there, sir. We are at, uh, we are at this really strange moment of in interregnum, which we might want to think about. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Tony. I mean, somehow, if I overstated it, and um, you know, we saw the red flag flying where, where it, you know, revolution is, is imminent, not at all. Um, we're structurally we're in a different place in terms of the global economy, et cetera, et cetera. But that notion of an interregnum, I'm quite happy with that. In fact, my introductory chapter is called A Bend in History's River. 
um, specifically because I, 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 I don't want to give the impression of a, a, a 180 degree turn or anything. It's a bend in the river. This is what the moment of, of, of 2019 was, I thought. Um, and absolutely, um, in, in uh, the, no, and I, 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 I make that point yeah. too. You know, I, I tried, I tried yeah. to make the point that the Anglophone Caribbean is in a peculiar place. Um, you know, if you, I, I mentioned Puerto Rico in 2019 and the, the uprisings there. I mentioned um, um, Haiti, uh, which at the time was undergoing a series of popular uprisings, a sort of resistance, but Haiti is a different case. But the Anglophone Caribbean was <laughs> not. And the question was, what is it about the Anglophone Caribbean that made it such a, a dead pool, is the word, word I used at this moment. So, so the, the, the pushback is where I am. And if, if, I, if I did give the impression in what I just said that we're somehow, uh, no, it is this interregnum that we're in. And there's also the, the Trumpian chapter in the book which tries to elaborate what's going on here. Um, but I agree with you, essentially. OK. Uh, <clears throat> let me suggest that uh, we could look at the current situation in the Caribbean. Uh, the Hold the mic closer. closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a result of the fact that the region, uh, you know, is in the grip of three basic forces. It has been captured by the neoliberal experiment. No question about that. Uh, as Lloyd Best put it, uh, it's a googly, which is a particular kind of ball, you bowl in cricket, that Caribbean, <laughs> <laughs> that Caribbean uh, political leaders have not yet found a way to hit out of the park. In other words, they hit a home run from it, right? So uh, neoliberalism is definitely something that has to be examined, looked at closely, and why it has paralyzed the region in a way that it has. Second, uh, and because of the visibility of uh, David Scott here, I think the region has also been captured by post-structuralism. And our thinking, uh, you know, has been, you know, really turned in that direction without really asking ourselves the question, how adequate, how relevant, how appropriate uh, post-structuralism is for the region. And I think we have to work through that very carefully because to me, <clears throat> there are a number of problems with post-structuralist thought that I have been arguing make it sort of inappropriate for the region. And third, <clears throat> there are the failures, the limitations, the lacks that have emerged from uh, the left in power. We have to look carefully, right, <clears throat> at the politics the policies, the behaviors of the left in power. And I think uh, if we look at these three forces objectively, as objectively as we can, the way forward, at least ways forward, not the way, ways forward emerge very clearly, right? So I don't, this is why I just don't see this as a tragic moment, you know? There's a way out of this. I mean, when you look at the crisis of the 1930s and you look at the crisis that we're in now, I would argue that the crisis of the 1930s uh, was a bigger, uh, uh, bigger crisis. This one, I think, is more complex because you have so many issues coming together at the same time. The environment, gender, sexuality, class, race, capital, right? In that way, it's more complex. But in terms of power relations, the kinds of things that need to be done, we can handle this. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, that's pretty much what I've been trying 
certainly in relation to the history of the left, um, and certainly in relation to, to, to at least tackling with David, uh, this is what I've been trying to do uh, in this book, um, you know, more or less. So I agree entirely with your, with your framing. Do we have any? So I, have, I have one really quick question. Yes. You can answer it fast. We have four minutes. And, yes. Um, I'm actually struck by the genres that you work in. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what those different ways of seeing, yeah. um, ways of analyzing a poet, a, a novelist, a scholar. Um, do you do you separate those when you bring your vision to these kinds of questions? Do do they inhabit a similar space? How do you make um, space for what to come forward when? Does that make sense to you? Um, it absolutely makes sense. If you live long enough, then you can actually inhabit some of these spaces in in problem space categories, to quote my friend David Scott again, right? Um, I, you know, I was a poet a long time ago, and I was only a poet. And I, I stopped writing poetry because I thought that being engaged in practical politics was the only way forward. And I stopped being engaged in practical politics uh, because practical politics closed its doors on me and people like me. And I started to think about being an academic. And so these are really, uh, the idea of going back to writing poetry is one that um, certainly um, I've discussed with Patsy. Um, but you know, I haven't found the space to do it s simultaneously with this sort of footnote driv driven fetish that we have in the academy, right? And so it's, 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 it's complicated, but um, yeah, I would like to think that, you know, in the morning you fish, in the evening you write poetry, the next day you um, write a book. But it doesn't quite work like that for me, at any rate. So if you live long enough, you get to write a novel and then write poetry, and it kind of looks like, like that, but it's, it's, it's more time, time and space separated. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for, for this and for the book. I have a question that was uh, after the initial presentation and of the series. And, uh, and uh, you guys all insisted a little bit of the role of, let's say, Fanon, Césaire, and also Présence Africaine. So my question is, um, in this way of understanding the Caribbean as a whole, right? you were discussing about your moving your research in a more pan-Caribbean perspective. Is there, any, um, is there any, let's say, editorial publishing project in which, um, like, as you said, like poetry and, and, and fiction and essays, since uh, Professor Brock said that, that currently you, let's say, from the series, you excluded poetry. Is there any pan-Caribbean um, editorial project in which all the three, lang three, four, many languages, in fact, are, are included, and in which, you know, sort of um, présence africaine, like, really uh, broad and, and, and can mm, beyond um, black radicalism, that it can really uh, provide this this, this broad understanding of the region uh, beyond the languages? I, I'll, I'll say something, and I'm sure that Aaron might have something to say as well, but um, the, the only consistent source that I know of that tries to publish in multiple languages is Casa de las Americas in Havana. And um, they are really a, a sort of vanguard and bridgehead for recognizing the multi multilingual nature of the Caribbean. Um, you know, there's, there's the University of the West Indies Press, which is primarily English. There's Ian Randall Publishers, which is primarily English. And we could think of, you know, equivalent smaller houses in other places. But uh, anyone who is doing that, and which is also critical for any Caribbean scholarship, thinking across this um, language divide, um, I don't know of. Um, I see Warren, 
in the audience too. He might have some ideas of, of setting that up one day, Warren Hardy, because uh, that's his interest, I know. Yeah, but yeah, um, I, I would similarly say to add to that, um, there is House of Nehesi uh, yes, with Lasana Sekou in um, St. Martin, and I think that they quite regularly publish um, uh, they publish Lamming's, George Lamming's Conversations too, and if I remember correctly, it was published in, was it Spanish, English, and French, French. edition, or was it just Spanish and English? I, I, I quite, I forget right now. Um, so yes, there are some publishing houses that are doing that. Publishing houses in the Caribbean, of course, are beset with um, many of the challenges that publishing houses anywhere and small publishing houses are beset with um, uh, many times fold, um, being that it's in the region. Okay. Mm. Um, I want to I thank everyone for coming. If you do have further questions, I want to remind you we have another panel, short break, reception, um, and then we'll reconvene to talk about Caribbean futures. And hopefully, you know, this has set up some thinking, some questions, giving you a context. You will go refresh a little bit come back um, and join us for the rest of the evening. Buy the book, buy the book, buy m multiple copies of the book. There are holidays that will be coming up soon. They will appreciate copies of these books. Let's sell out the book. How lovely would that be? If any of you with expense accounts who buy for departments, feel free to go deep into the book <laughs> buying. This is a book launch event, but thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.